Es ist dem Feind gelungen, die Front in breiter Formation zu durchbrechen. Im Süden hat der Gegner Zossen genommen und stößt auf Starnsdorf vor. Und im Osten ist der Feind bis zur Linie lichtenberg marsdorf karlshorst gelangt. Mit dem Angriff Steiners wird das alles in Ordnung kommen. Mein Führer. Steiner konnte nicht genügend Kräfte für einen Angriff massieren. Der Angriff Steiner ist nicht erfolgt. The Laughing Cavalier here, presenting to you another tale of these troubled times. Yet again, I'm doing a video I do not want to make, but, much like Lady Jane Grey herself, I have been forced into this position by powerful forces, namely my audience. What do y'all intend to do with me? Oh, not much. Democracy was a mistake. Before I begin, I'd better get this out of the way. As usual, every time I cover something like this, I get the usual horde of people screeching that... It's not a documentary, bro. Why do you care, bro? And so on. Well, yes. I will say this one is a little different in that it is an alt-history comedy, rather than, say, Napoleon, which was marketed as a serious biopic. So at least they are more upfront. However, we are still dealing with history. Most of the characters in this series are meant to be real people that existed. And, even if it is alt-history, there still has to be a bit of truth to that to begin with. For example... Let us take one of my favourite games, Victoria 2. One of the most popular old history mods is called Divergences of Darkness, where, basically, a bunch of historical events went differently. Amongst them, England won the Hundred Years' War and united with France, Burgundy became an independent kingdom, Castile united with Portugal instead of Aragon, and so on. Now, these scenarios are very wacky, but at the core, there is the possibility of truth. England, in another timeline, could well have won the Hundred Years' War, if perhaps a 17-year-old peasant girl hadn't turned up, or maybe if Henry V had not died of dysentery. An old history does not work if you change the principal basis for the existence of a person, country, etc. If I did an alt history where the Confederacy won the Civil War by abolishing slavery and solidifying power in Richmond, then that would not make any sense given the context of the era. Worse, if I then cast Morgan Freeman to play Robert E. Lee and Jennifer Lawrence as Jefferson Davis, it would make even less sense. This cannot be countered with, it's not a documentary, bro. Most people, who at least have a vague knowledge of the period, will know something is not right by just looking at the damn screen. You might be adding fiction to it, and this can be done successfully in, say, something like Blackadder, which was quite witty, and actually parodied tropes of that era. But here, though, they have chosen to use a real person, use her name for the series, and acknowledge that this is set in a historical time period covering events that she experienced, namely being forced onto the English throne. You may not like it if people criticise the inaccuracies, but this will happen regardless of your views. And that is why I am here. Look at me, I'm a famous historian! Out of my way! Now, whilst this is a breakdown of the trailer itself, much like I did with the Napoleon trailer, I will also be looking at what we know of the plot of the series, the behind the scenes and so forth, to give a more accurate view of what this will probably end up looking like. I will be using this as an opportunity to delve more into the life of Lady Jane Grey not least since I am scripting a rather exhaustive series on her life, so elements of that will be appearing in this video as well. Also, as always, I will mainly be using screenshots with timestamps to avoid copyright, save for some short clips if I feel they are necessary. The link to the full trailer will be in the description below. Be warned though, it took me an hour to watch the trailer in the first place, and I had to stop halfway through and shower since I felt unclean. Prepare to die. The radiation will kill you in three minutes. I will be fully honest here and say I despise everything about this series. Anyway, let us begin. The story of the nine, or really thirteen day queen, depending how you count it, has fascinated people for centuries. Jane was the great granddaughter of King Henry VII through his youngest daughter, thus giving Jane a claim to the throne, particularly once Henry VIII decided to push her ahead of the Stuarts and her own mother in his last will making her fourth in line behind his own children. 
This decision would come to have dire consequences for her when, six years later, Edward VI was dying, and, not wanting his Catholic half-sister Mary to take the throne, hurriedly tried to make a reluctant Jane his heir. When Edward died on the 6th of July, 1553, for 13 days, Jane was technically queen, before the coup fell apart, and, eventually, she went to the block at the age of 17 the following year. Soon, she was seen as something of a martyr of the Reformation, and particularly in the Victorian era, her story became very popular in art and literature. In terms of film and television, though, there have been surprisingly few adaptations of her on screen. Nina Vanna played her in a two-part silent movie from 1923 that is now lost. There was a rather odd, basically fictitious version in 1936, where she was portrayed by Nova Pilbeam. The Helena Bonham Carter, Lady Jane from 1986, that was also fairly fictitious, although probably the most accurate of the bunch, most notably the execution scene. And then, there were a few brief appearances of Jane's story in Becoming Elizabeth from 2022, where Bella Ramsey was criminally underused, with the series getting cancelled just as it was about to get to the nine days. Still, maybe someday we could get a serious look at the rather interesting life... <laughs> or, what we could do is throw that out of the window and make a pile of manure. Back in 2016, three women got together and wrote a book. I must resist the urge here to make a joke about how many people it takes to change a light bulb. This book, called My Lady Jane, is a young adult fantasy alt history comedy. In it, not only does Lady Jane Grey stay on the throne, but Catholics and Protestants are replaced with people who shapeshift into animals for some daft reason. And then this man appeared. Yes, I, I know he's no longer chairman and he wouldn't have ordered this personally anyway, but come on, give me some slack. Is he legally entitled to do this, Colonel? Well, I mean, if we can make a wacky comedy out of this, that gives me hope for my Hindenburg musical. Anyway, Amazon, seeing that Netflix was doing well with their alt-history race-swapped Bridgerton series, decided, but son, we have Bridgerton at home, and adapted this book into a series, all used it as a basis, as we shall get into later. Officially announced in August of 2022, the casting was... interesting, to say the least. 20-something American actress Emily Bader was cast as Jane, nearly 30-something Edward Blumel as Guilford Dudley, and then Jordan Peters as Edward VI. Yes, we'll also get back to that later. In November, further casting was announced, with a few more well-known faces in the mix. Most notably, Rob Brydon as Lord Dudley, Jim Broadbent as the Duke of Leicester, we'll get back to that later as well, and Anna Chancellor as Frances Grey, Jane's mother. Surprisingly, the production was very secretive, to the point that there were basically no behind-the-scenes photos until very recently. We do know filming took place in a number of historic locations, Kent Castle, as always, standing in for the Tower of London. Hurstmonshire Castle and Great Charlfield Manor were also used amongst others. Filming took place over the course of roughly six months from late 2022 to early 2023, with an alleged release date for later that year. However, there was an apparent delay, and basically no news, save for Rob Brydon discussing it on his podcast. Then, in April of 2024, Amazon broke their silence and released a bunch of production images with a release date of the 27th of June, which was then followed by an actual trailer on the 21st of May. Let us now dive in and have a look. Well, right off the bat, we get the tone of how Jane's story will be treated. The narrator tells us that history remembers Jane as the ultimate damsel in distress, which... eh? A noble lady from Tudor, England, caught up in a Game of Thrones level power struggle, which cost her her head, is not the same as Penelope Pitstop being tied to an overcomplicated death trap and having to be saved by a bunch of other wacky racist characters. In one article from Tatler, the author tells us that The Amazon Prime video show is the first to erase the real story and replace it with something entirely fictional. The series is a part of a trend to portray female historical characters as proto-feminist, independent young women for the upcoming TikTok generation. Ah yes, a strong female character who don't need no saving. For Prime Video's new series is turning a historic damsel in distress into a strong and independent woman. I am woman, hear me roar, in numbers too big to ignore. This would have been a revolutionary concept in the year of our Lord 1924. However, it is a hundred years later, and these days, basically every period piece has done this. Hell, I may have joked about Penelope Pitstop earlier, but she actually saved herself most of the time back in the late 60s. It's kind of set in the 1910s. I have now decreed this to be a period piece. Ah, I am safe. 
I also find it rather demeaning of Jane herself, reducing her to a damsel in this scenario, when, even though she was a pawn, she still had some power. For example, at one point during her brief reign, there was a debate as to who was to command the army being sent against Mary, the two choices being John Dudley, the Duke of Northumberland, who was the Lord President of the Privy Council, and the man basically running the coup to put Jane on the throne, or Henry Grey, Duke of Suffolk, who was Jane's father. A contemporary account, today generally known as the Chronicle of Queen Jane, related what happened next. Whereupon, by speedy counsel, it was there concluded that the Duke of Suffolk, with certain other noblemen, should go towards the Lady Mary to fetch her up to London. This was first determined, but by the night of the same day, the same voyage of the Duke of Suffolk was clean dissolved by special means of the Lady Jane, his daughter, who, taking the matter heavily, with weeping tears, made request to the whole council that her father might tarry at home in her company. Whereupon the council persuaded with the Duke of Northumberland to take the voyage upon him, saying that no man was so fit therefore, because he had achieved the victory in Norfolk once already. The Duke of Northumberland had effectively been regent for Edward VI since 1549. He was previously an experienced politician, having served Henry VIII as well. Yet here he was, apparently forced to follow another course by a 16-17-year-old girl, albeit one who was the Queen. So yes, damsel in distress is an odd label for one like Jane. During this narration, we get some scenes of Jane being led into the Tower of London, followed by a few shots of a blindfolded Jane with her head on the chopping block. As anyone with even the most cursory knowledge of Jane will know, her execution in February of 1554 was one of the most infamous decisions of the whole story. The most famous moment came when she blindfolded herself and, after kneeling down, failed to find the block and had to be guided to it by an onlooker, most famously depicted in the Paul de la Roche painting from the early 19th century. The trailer portrays this as though it is a bad thing that people know about her from her death. I find this odd, since being known for a tragic end is not a bad thing. Hell, the Titanic is the epitome of a bad ending. But if the voyage went well, I doubt anyone would really know about her in anywhere near as much detail. I'll go into costuming in a bit, but in terms of other elements, this scene looks very weird. Judging from other shots in the trailer, it appears that even in this alt history, Jane will get deposed by Mary and face the axe but then we'll manage to escape or something, if this very derpy looking shot of Jane escaping on a horse is anything to go by. Weirdly though, the execution is being held in the middle of the night. Now, I'm not a Tudor monarch, so I'm not used to these sort of things, but if I were having someone executed in front of a crowd, wouldn't you want it to be in the daytime when they can see things? In fact, it is probably difficult enough for the executioner to see what he's doing in this light. Also, why is Jane's younger sister, and what I think is meant to be Queen Mary, the first and others watching? Jane was executed privately within the Tower of London, and her family, nor Mary, were present. Immediately, I have a bit of a problem with the casting for Jane. Historically, Jane was 17 when she was executed, according to most sources, and was probably about 16 or 17 when Edward VI died. Emily Bader, meanwhile, was about 25 to 26 when filming this, being nearly a decade older than the real Jane. Ah yes, but alt history. It could be going years later. I doubt it, since the series seemed to be firmly set over the course of no more than a year, since her younger sister looks about the same age throughout. Of course, they have publicly announced that it will have Rompy Pompey, so this is probably why she is much older. But this is the problem. Jane's story is not about things like that. She was caught up in the deadly power struggle that had its roots in Henry VIII's attempts to secure the succession which led to the English Reformation and split the country. Focusing on romance and love in this is like having a film about the Titanic, but instead of the sinking, it is extended scenes about the catering and the rearranging of the deck chairs. Jane's youth as well was something that made her stand out so much. Other than English, she spoke French, Latin, Greek, Italian, and had some knowledge of Hebrew and Aramaic, all by the time she was about 14. Then her tragic end at the age of 17 is what draws many to her, the actress does not look like a young teenager. Also, I'm not entirely against Americans playing English roles. Robert Maxwell in The Shadow of the Tower is my favourite Henry VII, for example. But I have a gut feeling that a millennial something Californian will not fit right for me in this role. Now, the authenticity of the clothing in this series leaves much to be desired. To begin, we must use a metric I often look to when evaluating the costumes in a Tudor series, the Hood Test. 
Throughout this era, women always tied up their hair and wore hoods to cover their heads. One of the few exceptions would be if a queen was being crowned, and of course when out riding, women may wear a hat instead, but other than that, it was always hoods. By the 1550s, the French hood was the most dominant, the older English or gable hood having long since died out. The style had changed a bit over the years, becoming a bit more pushed back compared to earlier versions. Are there any hoods in this? Nope, not one. Save for these two women on the scaffold with Jane, wearing fashion more suited for well into the reign of Elizabeth I. Major failure of the hood test. And please don't give me the budget excuse for the lack of them. Becoming Elizabeth had hoods on a smaller budget, and also, uh, well, we will come back to the excesses in other departments later. Even the dresses look inaccurate, particularly the Grey Sisters. These three are the daughters of a Duke of the Realm. Where the hell are their jewels? On screen are some portraits of the sisters. Admittedly, the last is from the Elizabethan era, but still, these are way better looking than whatever they're wearing here. They might as well be playing peasants. At least their mother looks a bit better. Not that any of this matters, because then the narrator man tells us that, if that, in regards to the history, which sets the tone going forward. We then get a shot of Jane waking up, apparently, after being sent back, I assume, as the narrator man tells us, what if history were different? This could be just for the trailer, but if not, does this mean it will actually start out with her dying, and then she gets sent back in time or something? Interesting if so, but I think this is a thing just for the trailer. Anyway, more importantly, we get to meet King Edward VI. Historically, Edward was born in 1537, being the only surviving son of King Henry VIII. Contrary to some later portrayals in media, he was actually a quite healthy boy growing up, even taking part in some mock battles with friends. It was only in 1552 that his health really started to decline, and even then, it did not look serious until early 1553. Edward inherited the red hair of the Tudors, and was definitely moulded in the image of his father. Had he not died at the age of 15, his reign could have changed England, making it much more Protestant, as opposed to the more moderate church his half-sister Elizabeth I went for. Now, there is an obvious elephant in the room that I need to bring up. The actor is way older than the 15-year-old Edward. Oh my god! Oh yeah, and the other elephant. Yet again, it appears we have another Anne Boleyn situation on our hands. It is getting rather tiring at this point. I'm so tired. Again, yes, I know this is an alt history comedy, but this is still meant to be Edward the Sixth. If you are parodying someone, it usually helps if the actor looks like the person being parodied somewhat. From a historical perspective, Tudor England was not diverse by modern standards. There was some limited diversity, if you will, with people like John Blank, Henry VIII's black trumpeter, so you could have made a character like that. But I suspect at this point, studios are doing this just to cause outrage, in the hope that it will drive more views, or give more press to their work. Elizabeth as well is certainly not the pale-skinned redhead that she was. But then, oddly, Mary is white. How that works, I don't know. But yes... This is getting rather tiring now, and I'm fed up of how this has suddenly become the norm in anything Tudor related at the moment. In the scene, we have some brilliant dialogue between the academic Jane and Edward that consists of King Edward, I have terrible news. My mother's forcing me to marry. Jane, this marriage protects us. Will you intervene? I've already approved it. I don't think I need to say much more other than the members of the court would probably be a bit more reverential with each other. We also get to see Jane's mother, Frances Grey played by Anna Chancellor. Sadly, it looks like we'll be going down the usual tropes of her being an evil force. It would be prudent here to take a look at Jane's mother and father. For many centuries, most notably in the 19th, it was common to portray Jane's parents as being abusive to their daughter, when, in reality, they were apparently quite loving of her by the standards of the time. Her father, Henry Grey, gave his daughter a very good education, and those tutors had a positive impression of the family. John Aylmer, who knew them quite well, wrote to the reformer Henry Bullinger regarding Jane, whom her father loves as a daughter. Henry Grey was fairly well praised in his own lifetime as well, even if he was definitely rash in his decisions, most notably in 1530, when he broke his marriage contract to Catherine Fitzalan, causing a major fallout with his mother. By 1550, though, John of Ulm, a Protestant reformer, wrote of the Duke, He is descended from the royal family, with which he is very nearly connected, and is the most honourable of the king's privy council. He has exerted himself up to the present day with the greatest zeal and labour, courageously to propagate the gospel of Christ. He is a thunderbolt and terror of the papers, that is, a fierce and terrible adversary. 
He spoke most nobly in defense of the Eucharist in the last parliament. He is very much looked up to by the king. He is learned and speaks Latin with elegance. He is the protector of all students and the refuge of the foreigners. That is not to say bad things happened. Corporal punishment, which is today frowned upon, was back then the norm, and we do have some reference to this happening to Jane. However, in the context of the era, it was not seen as unusual. Whilst we do have Aylward's much later account of Jane complaining about her parents, it is quite likely that he fictionalised that particular encounter, since, by the 1570s, he was pushing for reform on that very issue. Please see Dr Stephen Edwards' lecture on this for more details, link below. And of course, Suffolk's decision to join Wyatt's rebellion against Mary I was a major factor in sealing his daughter's fate. Jane herself did not hold a grudge though it seems, not counting a probably fake letter that was included in Fox's Acts and Monuments. One relic to survive is the prayer book Jane carried with her to the scaffold. Just before her execution, she wrote some farewell messages in it, including one to her father which reads, The Lord comfort your grace, and that in his word, wherein all creatures only are to be comforted. And though it hath pleased God to take away two of your children, yet think not, I humbly beseech your grace, that you have lost them. But trust that we, by leaving this mortal life, have won an immortal life. And I, for my part, as I have honoured your grace in this life, will pray for you in another life. Your grace's humble daughter, Jane Dudley. Frances, meanwhile, has been depicted as cold, uncaring, and ambivalent over the fate of her daughter. One piece of evidence used against her is that Jane did not write to her before the end, but it turns out this is probably not true, since Florio, who had taught Jane Italian and knew the family, stated that Jane had written a letter to her mother that has since been lost. Frances herself even broke protocol by holding Jane's train as she entered the tower during the 9-13 days. As her mother, she would have had the right to stand in front of her, but instead she went behind, possibly to support her. Interestingly, it appears Francis may have actually been opposed to the match to Guildford in the first place. According to a letter from the Venetian diplomatic mission from July 1553, The Duke of Suffolk, Jane's father, was persuaded of it, and overcome by the inducements and effective methods of this man. But the Duchess of Suffolk, with all her household, would not have wished, and the daughter was forced there by the father, with a beating as well. Here, though, it appears as though Francis was betrayed as a schemer who was the one behind the marriage. In all of this, you may be asking, where the hell is Jane's father? Well, apparently, he has died in this universe. Dead? How? When? According to an interview with one of the creators in the Cosmopolitan, There was, in fact, a dad involved in the real Jane Grey, like there is in the book. There was an opportunity to play on the trope of the woman whose husband is dead and is doing whatever she can to marry her daughters off. You know, like Miss Bennet. Oh, Caroline, will you please shut the f*** up? <laughs> the problem with killing Jane's father is that, if he were dead, then the whole incident with Jane convincing Northumberland to go and lead the army cannot happen. More importantly, though, one of the reasons why Mary eventually had Jane executed was that Suffolk had joined Wyatt's rebellion against Mary. If her father is out of the picture, this does not happen. But then again, I suspect Mary will still get screwed over. Francis says the marriage protects us, implying that her family is powerless somehow. In reality, the Greys owned one of the great estates in England, Bradgate Park, and had influence, with Henry Grey being a member of the Privy Council. Frances and her surviving family did fall on hard times, but that was after the execution of her husband and daughter, and even then she was still a duchess. If anything, Jane was marrying down by wedding the fourth son of the Duke of Northumberland. Speak of the devil, here we meet what is meant to be the Duke of Northumberland, played by Rob Brydon but for some reason he's just called Lord Dudley in this. Northumberland was one of the most capable Tudor statesmen. In his short time as Edward's regent, he managed to partly fix the economy, secure peace with Scotland and France, and solidify the Edwardian Reformation, if such a term can be used. However, all of that would be thrown out of the window when Edward fell ill. Traditionally, and even at the time, everyone assumed that the plan to put Jane on the throne was mainly Northumberland's doing evidenced by the fact that he married his fourth son, Guildford Dudley, to Jane. However, more recent scholarship, most notably by the late Eric Ives, has challenged this view, and points to the fact that in February 1553, he even invited Mary to court and oversaw a ceremony where she was restored the use of the royal arms, and was received by many prominent peers, including both Northumberland and Suffolk, suggesting that he was preparing for Mary to take over. Edward, meanwhile, was a major driver, being the one who created his device for the succession. Oh, what a diabolical device! 
the draft of which we still have in his own hand, which, again, shows his commitment to the plan, if, whilst in a serious condition, he was writing and editing the thing himself. After Mary became queen, it was a lot easier to simply throw Northumberland under the bus as though the entire scheme was his rather than Edward's, and make him into a Grima worm tongue figure. Even the marriage to Jane was not his original plan. Before her, he had hoped to have Guildford engaged to Margaret Clifford, Jane's cousin, who was much lower down the line of succession, but this fell apart when her father refused to agree to the match. The match to Guildford had been arranged before Edward came up with his device, and in the original draft, he initially planned that if Francis had a son, then they would inherit over Jane's potential son, which would not have benefited Northumberland. Still, I expect we'll just get a caricature from Rob Brydon, although the historical Jane did have a particular loathing for the Duke. We get to meet Guildford Dudley, played by Edward Blumel, who is most certainly not a teenager. The historical Guildford is actually a bit of a mystery, since there is practically no mention of him until Northumberland married him to Jane. It is commonly believed he was a few years older than Jane, although more recent research suggests he might have been about the same age or possibly slightly younger. As the fourth son, it is doubtful to expect he would have had an important career, but all of that changed in early 1553 when he was betrothed to Jane. However, it appears that this series will basically be paying homage, or just outright copying, plot points from the 1986 movie, where the two become tragic lovers. In reality, Whilst Jane did write that she loved her husband as a wife does, she doesn't seem to have gone much beyond that. After their marriage, she spent many weeks apart from him, preferring to stay with her mother, in a desperate attempt to stay away from the Dudley family. Interesting that she says here that she wants independence, when it was probably independence from the Dudleys that she would have craved more. Then there is a rather odd fight in the tavern. What I want to focus on, though, is how the soldiers here are outfitted. Remember earlier when I said they had overspent in some areas? Well, the military side of things is one of them. The soldiers of mid-Tudor England would have looked quite colourful. The yeomen of the guard wore red tunics with large hats and feathers in them, for example. Even the ordinary yeomanry would have looked quite striking. Very few soldiers would be wearing full sets of armour, yet here, all of them are. Not to mention, the helmets look more suited for Game of Thrones rather than the Tudor period. The only exception are these soldiers here, but even they are too armoured. Again, if you wanted to parody this period, then doing these quite striking costumes would not have only been more accurate, but likely would have been far better and save you more money, as opposed to all of this armour, unless you had it left over from some other production. Also, throughout the trailer, these heavily armed soldiers seem to be about as useful as a stormtrooper with cataracts. Sorry about the landing, boys. This fog is so thick I can't see my own cataracts. They are routinely being beaten by peasants, and the slightest blow seems to be enough to take them out. And then, well, I'll just play it if I can. I'll need a dagger. That's not a dagger. This is a dagger. That's not a knife, that's a spoon. <laughs> I see you've plied knifey spoony before. This is the funniest joke in the trailer, and it comes from a nearly 40-year-old movie. You'll forgive me if I don't have a lot of confidence in the comedy aspect. In fact, the creators also told us what their inspiration was. We always wanted to pay homage to like Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and the Princess Bride. Most of all, these are our touch points. I'm gonna cut your heart out with a spoon! And then, the worst line in the trailer for me. Francis tells us, intercut with a few other shots, that there is always power if you know how to play the game and gamesmanship is my second best skill. Her youngest daughter then asks what her best skill is, and she responds with a sexual reference that I will not repeat here. Sorry for the Mary Whitehouse act for a moment, but why? If you cannot tell by now, I don't like historical figures being slandered, and this is borderline slander. Francis was apparently quite happily married before Henry Grey had an unfortunate mishap involving an axe going through his neck. She did remarry within a year, but by then she was in financial trouble after her husband had many of his estates seized, and with two remaining daughters, she still had to support them. Implying that she is a loose woman, shall we say, does not sit well with me. Again, we do not have any firm letters from her regarding opinions on her first husband, but as late as 1552, he certainly cared for her. In that year, Francis fell ill with a sweating sickness. Jane had probably also been ill with it earlier in the year, since John of Ulm wrote to Henry Bullinger in February that the Duke's daughter has recovered from a severe and dangerous illness. 
Francis, meanwhile, seemed to be close to death. In August, Henry Grey wrote to William Cecil that, I never saw a more sickly creature in my life than she is. She had three diseases. The first is a hot burning ague that doth hold her 24 hours. The other is a stopping of the spleen. The third is a hypochondriac passion. These three being enclosed in one body, it is to be feared that death must needs follow. He signed off his letter to Cecil by saying, By your most assured and loving cousin, who I assure you is not a little troubled. Now, we have not only gotten rid of her husband, who cared for her, but we now have made up a fictional Dudley brother for her to have an affair with as well. Why? How is any of this superior to the truth? And then, uh, Edward the Sixth kissing a guy? Why? Why are you gay? Who says I'm gay? You are gay. And before people cite that one letter, no, he wasn't telling Barnaby Fitzpatrick to be gay with other men. He was telling him to be careful with women who might trick him and to keep close with his friends. Can you please stop reading gay relationships into everything? The rest of this segment consists of some soldiers fighting people, including a fictional childhood friend of Jane, some all lovey-dovey scenes that I will not elaborate on, and then Jane sword fighting and beating Guildford. I find it funny that the original book creator, at least, claimed they were fascinated with her. Yet in this trailer, she is running around doing stuff Jane was not known for, nor would any lady in Tudor England have done. Jane is interesting because of her intellect and the story of the 9-13 days, not because she was running around fighting people with swords. I will give some grudging praise for the locations used for filming. They have indeed picked places that look quite Tudor and appropriate for the most part, but I should be more thankful to the architects who built them centuries ago rather than Amazon. Then, a scene of Mary, played by Cato Flynn. In some ways, Queen Mary I is one of the most tragic figures of the Tudor era. The eldest child of Henry VIII, she saw her world turned upside down when her father annulled his marriage to her mother, and stripped her of her title. On top of that, the Reformation then saw the religion of the country change, whilst Mary stayed loyal to the old Catholic faith. Under Edward's regime, she was persecuted for this, and at one point considered fleeing the country. Then, when Edward died, she was nearly denied the throne, but managed to overcome the odds and seize it back. This honeymoon did not last, though, and her reign started to fall apart. In early 1553, she faced Wyatt's rebellion, in opposition to her proposed marriage to Philip of Spain. She crushed it, but one side effect of this was that she was forced to sign Jane's death warrant. After this, she then proceeded to oversee the Marian persecutions of Protestants, in which nearly 300 were burned at the stake. And then, her actual marriage to Philip of Spain was an unhappy one, thanks to the latter staying away from England for long periods of time. All it achieved was to drag England into Spain's war with France and lose England to the port of Calais. In 1558, she died at the age of 42, with her legacy in tatters. Now, will there be any nuance with this figure in the series? Well, judging from the picture of her almost screaming whilst holding a headsman's axe in the poster, I doubt it. The trailer says there are powerful forces conspiring against the king, which is probably going to be Mary. I dread to think what this scene of her screeching like a soy jack will be, probably finding out Jane is queen or something. Later in the trailer, there is also a shot of her uh, fighting Jane in a garden and almost strangling her. Considering the real-life Mary was a friend of Francis, and even gave gifts of jewellery to a young Jane, and as mentioned had to be almost forced into signing her death warrant, this will probably end up being the worst portrayal of Mary on screen. And then, nuns. Nuns! Nuns! Reverse! 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 Specifically, a guy dressed up like a nun trying to kill Edward with a flail. It should be noted, there was no plot to kill Edward in 1553, and certainly not by his own sisters. And I say sisters, since it looks like Elizabeth is trying to poison him as well in this scene, or at least that's what I think it is. Why on earth Elizabeth would be doing this is anyone's guess. But at this point, they have proven they care not for the interesting stories of these people. This character here, stating that Mary is the rightful heir to the throne, is called Lord Seymour in the cast. This is a bit odd, since the only two important Seymours of Edward's reign were his uncles, Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset, and Lord Thomas Seymour. Both of them were lacking their heads by this point, so I doubt it is them unless they somehow returned. Anywho, this is when they suggest Jane is heir to Edward, I don't think there is much more here I can add. Some shots of what looked like Jane and Guildford being arrested, followed by a... guy... I don't know, he's probably going to be Henry VIII, judging from the casting thus far. Jane tells us that, as you can see, I still have my head, and I intend to keep it, and that she wants my life to be mine. 
Well, best of luck with that, since it looks like it's going to be a challenge even in this version. Related to that point, this here is probably the only part of the trailer I will give some praise for. Here, it appears Jane is in the tower after being deposed, and is visited by her youngest sister. It does look like Jane will at least be shown to have some compassion and love for her family here, which is nice to see. Now, as far as we know, Jane was not visited by her family in the tower, but she did write to them, most notably just before her execution. In her letter to Catherine, the middle sister, Jane gave her a book and some guidance. I have here sent you, good sister Catherine, a book, which, although it be not outwardly trimmed with gold, yet inwardly it is more worth than precious stones. It is the book, dear sister, of the law of the Lord. It is his testament and last will, which he bequeathed unto us wretches, which shall lead you to the path of eternal joy. And if you with a good mind read it, and with an earnest mind do follow it, it shall bring you to an immortal and everlasting life. And as touching my death, rejoice as I do, good sister, that I shall be delivered of this corruption, and put on incorruption, for I am assured that I shall, for losing of a mortal life, win an immortal life, the which I pray God grant you, send you of his grace, to live in his fear, and to die in the true Christian faith, from the which in God's name I exhort you that you never swerve, neither for hope of life, nor for fear of death. Of course, I doubt Jane's devotion to the Reformation will make an appearance. This gets worse and worse. Although I do have a little hope that perhaps a steadfastness and calm manner in the face of death will be present, since it was such a defining part of her story. Just a fool's hope. Although at 2.20 we get another brief look at her imprisoned in what looks like the usual dreary cell with bars on the window, which is a trope I utterly detest in all Tudor media. In reality, she was basically under house arrest in the home of William Partridge during her imprisonment. She was allowed servants and even dined with guests, most notably the writer of the contemporary chronicle of Queen Jane, as it is often called today. There are some shots here I went into earlier, so we'll now just focus on the last few bits. I don't know what this final clip is. She's lying on a table. She says bollocks. Uh, anyway, we are nearly there. This appears to be Jane's wedding to Guildford. Now, the king would have not walked her down the aisle since he was a bit preoccupied coughing up horrible stuff from his lungs at that point. <laughs> Historically, it was actually quite a grand occasion. Contemporary reports state that there was jousting and two days of feasting. It is possible these shots are from just after the wedding as well. I will say, some of the dresses look a bit better compared to what we saw before, but still not really right for the era. The men look a bit too Elizabethan as well, I would say. And of course, ruffs are not free-floating things, by the way. Well, we are there with the trailer. But, before we wrap things up, I will just go over some other points that were either not mentioned, or are things I wanted to elaborate upon. As I mentioned right at the start, Jim Broadbent is in this, although he did not appear in the trailer. Apparently, he is playing a fictional uncle to Jane with the title of Duke of Leicester, of which there has never been a Duke of Leicester. Why make up an uncle whilst, at the same time, eliminating her own father, the Duke of Suffolk? I did briefly mention Blackadder earlier, but to reiterate, if you were to do some sort of parody of this era, then making it a bit more detached like they did would make more sense. The only historical characters in Blackadder the Second are Queen Elizabeth the First, Sir Walter Raleigh, and that's about it, really. Most of the rest are parodies of stereotypes associated with the era or fiction of the era. It is possible that this Duke of Leicester character might be falling into that category, but I can hardly see him comparing to some of the greats from Blackadder. Captain Rum has to be the perfect sea captain. Oh, you have a woman! <laughs> Elizabeth's reign with explorers, Puritans, and so on, was more suited for parody, and it helped that the writing was good with witty humour, which I see no evidence of in this series. Jane's story, meanwhile, is more suited for that of a tragedy. Making comedy out of it is an odd move. That's not to say there are some individual incidents that could have been used. We do know that at Jane's wedding, Guildford got food poisoning, for example. Probably the most humorous encounter could be this incident that Jane related herself again involving Guildford. 
and also showing that she had some power. After being forced to try on the crown, Jane was told that one would be made for her husband, and that he would be crowned king. This did not sit right with her, leading to an altercation with his mother. But afterwards I sent for the earls of Arundel and Pembroke, and said to them that if the crown belonged to me, I should be content to make my husband a duke, but would never consent to make him king. Which resolution of mine gave his mother, this my opinion being related to her, great cause for anger and disdain, so that she, being very angry with me, and greatly displeased, persuaded her son not to sleep with me any longer as he was wont to do, affirming to me, moreover, that he did not wish in any wise to be a duke but a king. There is something you could parody there, but only element, and I would actually be shocked if they even referenced them, not least since, as far as I'm aware, the Duchess of Northumberland has not been cast in this. The centre of Jane's story is a power struggle. Of all the parts of Tudor history to parody, you went for probably one of the worst parts to do that with. It is bad considering how few times she has really been portrayed on screen in any sizeable way. Now, we actually have a proper nearly 8 hour series on her, and it is this garbage. What is worse is of course how disrespectful the makers of this series seem to be towards their source material. For example, this is the official press release from Amazon. Hold your loins for the tragic tale of Lady Jane Grey, the young Tudor noblewoman who was Queen of England for nine days and then beheaded back in good old 1553. Actually, f*** that. We're retelling history the way it should have happened. The damsel in distress saves herself. This is an epic tale of true love and high adventure set in an alternate universe of action, history, fantasy, comedy, romance, and lumpy pumpy. Buckle up. This is disgusting. The way it should have happened. The tone is so sneering and condescending towards those interested in this period, as though the historical facts are a bad thing. Even then though, is it really as fictitious as they claim? If that were the case, then we would not have a character called Lady Jane Grey, eldest of three sisters, with a mother called Frances, who was forced into becoming the heir to King Edward VI. They are also still going to have her get deposed and nearly beheaded from the looks of things, which is not how it should have gone if you are a supporter of Jane. If you wanted to do something fictitious, you could have set this in a fantasy world with a girl who was forced to become queen without dragging the names of these interesting historical figures through the mud. To give an example, and I know I usually save this for rant videos, but I'm going to bring up an anime, and that is Tear Moon Empire. The main premise is that Princess Mia Luna Tear Moon, daughter of the Emperor, is arrested and then guillotined following a revolution, only to wake up several years in the past when she is 12, but with the foreknowledge of what is about to happen. Interesting if something like that will happen in My Lady Jane. Her character is somewhat based on Marie Antoinette, or at least more the tropes that surround her. Now, if this was actually Marie Antoinette, there would be problems, but it is not, since they have merely taken the concept of royal figure hated by people, gets executed, then goes back in time and tries to fix things. My Lady Jane, meanwhile, has kept the name and pays lip service to some elements of Jane's story, but otherwise has decided to just make her into a bog standard girl boss for want of a better term. Mia, meanwhile, isn't like that at all, and even gets kidnapped and nearly killed in a few scenarios, but manages to get out of them, quite often through bluffing, sheer luck, and people misinterpreting her actions as four-dimensional chess moves, which of course helps. I can't see the comedy holding up well with My Lady Jane either, whereas Tear Moon does have some great visual gags. <laughs> Not least Mia's many meanable faces. Overall, My Lady Jane, or to use its full title according to this poster, My Love Trees and Lady Death Jane, looks absolutely awful, and I hate everything about this series on a molecular level. It is like it was scientifically designed to annoy me. There is no respect for the historical Jane. The authenticity is whack, particularly with the casting, and even if we were to go to the lowest denominator and purely look at it as a comedy, the humour in the trailer we have seen seems to be non-existent, and consists of every tired trope of the past 10 years or so. I will not review this series at all, partly because I have such a backlog, but mainly because there is no point. 
barely any of the story will be there. They do not care in the slightest, and I think I would just have a stroke trying to comprehend it all. Now, I am not a fortune teller, but the fact Amazon is dumping all eight episodes at once, coupled with the minimal promotion until now, makes me think even they know this won't be a hit, and that it will not get a season two. Although, then again, that hasn't stopped them in the past. Either way, I hope this is the last time I will ever have to hear about My Lady Jane. Anyway, this has been The Laughing Cavalier, wishing you a good day.